afternoon from Axiom Space Mission Control in Houston, Texas. My name is John Rackham, the Crew Systems Deputy Manager here at Axiom Space. Today is flight day five, and this is our second daily update of the Axiom 1 mission currently underway on the International Space Station. This mission is the first all-private mission to the ISS, and the crew's schedules are full of all sorts of groundbreaking science, research, technology demonstrations, and outreach events. Today, we're going to learn a bit more about the science and research efforts that are currently in play. But before we do, let's introduce you to the crew. The AX-1 mission is commanded by retired NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria, a Spanish-American who was born in Madrid, Spain, and who is also called Mission Viejo, California, as well as Boston, Massachusetts, home. Michael is a U.S. Navy captain and has flown three times aboard the space shuttle and once aboard Soyuz. In 2021, he was inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. The pilot for AX-1 is Larry Connor from Dayton, Ohio. Through AX-1, he has now become the first private pilot to reach ISS. He has also become the first human to reach both the deepest ocean depths and pass beyond the bounds of outer space within one year. Larry has been actively involved with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic for many years, helping to understand the effects of aging. This mission is adding a new dimension to several of these studies. Serving as Mission Specialist 1, Eitan Stibba is now the second Israeli ever to fly to space. In collaboration with the Ramon Foundation, the Israeli Space Agency, and the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology, and the Ministry of Education, Stiba is flying to the ISS under the Rakia banner and the maxim, there is no dream beyond reach. And rounding out our crew, Mark Pathy is Mission Specialist 2 on the AX-1 mission. Mark is an entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist, and is currently the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of Montreal-based Maverick a privately owned investment and financing company he founded that focuses on innovation and social impact. Through the AX-1 mission, Pathy has become Canada's second private astronaut and the 12th Canadian to go to space. So joining me now is Axiom Space's Director of In-Flight Manufacturing and Research, Christian Mainder. Christian, thank you for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, you and I spoke just a few days ago during the launch webcast for this mission about the range of science and research efforts that this crew is undertaking in just their eight days on orbit. So tell us a little bit more about what they've got in front of them. Well, they're a couple days in on their research. They're just starting to get their space and research legs underneath them. They um, have completed an enormous amount of work in the last couple of days on orbit. Um, and uh, they have, you know, four to five more days of work that they have in front of them. So really, they've accomplished some of the first sessions mm -hmm. of their science, and they're going to be going into repetitions for in in continued data collections. Um, and then ultimately, they'll be getting ready to pack up near the end of the mission, bring samples and s science home, and, and uh, come on home. Fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and unpack that a bit for all of our viewers at home. Um, and let's start, you know, specifically with Aton. What does he have on his plate today? Well, it's been a busy day. I actually brought some notes just to be able to keep up with it all. Um, <laughs> some of the cool things that Aton did today were um, he worked on a project called Fluid, Fluidic Space Optics. Mm. It's a project where you actually are using microgravity and the, and the, the physics of surface tension okay. to take a polymer that's a liquid and put it into a frame to form a spherical lens. It's not unlike kind of putting a bubble yeah. on, on, a, on, a, on a bubble wand mm -hmm. when you're a kid. Um, surface tension will form this kind of perfect spherical lens. You yeah. can hit it with some UV and you can actually cure it into a solid lens. Nice. Now the implications of this are if, you, if this works, you could potentially create really large optics for space, um, in space, yeah. and then you wouldn't have to necessarily create them, make them, grind them, polish them on yeah. the ground, and then launch them to orbit. Yeah, then, you know, it really touches on kind of the what's the only way you can get that really is in this microgravity environment, right? Because of the, the aspects of water tension or surface tension rather with those fluids, you know, you get something very special with performing this on orbit. Yeah. And he, he worked hard at this all afternoon. I think he made four small lenses and one large lens. Excellent. And so, uh, it was, it was a cool project this afternoon. Excellent. Excellent. Well, um, you know, there, there are, um, uh, our other crew that we have on orbit too, Larry Connor, what kind of things was Larry working on today? So uh, Larry focused on today, he focused on conducting a project called Neuro Wellness. Okay. Um, it's basically a way to look at, can you measure cognitive performance and brain activity in space? So he actually has this helmet-like looking device that has full of sensors that measure brain activity. And he wore that today and he's gonna wear it for a couple more times on orbit to get um, some measurements to see how uh, microgravity affects brain activity. Okay. And uh, yesterday, he did a really amazing project with him and Mike L.A. worked on this together. Uh, it's called Aging and Heart Health. But he was working inside the life science glove box on the space station where he was actually feeding live cells that he brought with him on oh, wow. the mission. 
Uh, these cells are, are aging cells and also cardiac stem cells, and it's looking at the implications of how microgravity affects both of those kinds of biologies and what, what are the impacts from a microgravity perspective. Great. So one of those, you know, an example of some of the... Um uh, you know, physiological and, and medical research based uh, type experiments that he was really, you know, touching on before his mission. Yeah, what's kind of cool is for this project that we're looking at stuff like this at a cellular level, okay. but then we're also looking at it at a human level by mm -hmm. doing some measurements before and after and during flight as well. And so that data combined with the cellular data may mm -hmm. reveal some really interesting intersections. Nice. Excellent. Well, you know, moving on, um, wh wh what does Mark Pathy's day look like? Well, let's see. Mark uh, had a busy day. He did some Earth observations today uh, for uh, targets in Canada and mm. around Canada. And then um, one of the coolest projects that he is doing, he did the second session today and the first one yesterday. It's called Holoportation. Okay. It's actually an activity where he wears these augmented reality goggles. And through, um, through the connections through satellites and through passing through massive number of firewalls between, <laughs> between NASA and the ground, we are able to port a, a three-dimensional three uh, figure of someone on the ground talking to him, and That's vice so cool. versa, we're able to port Mark down to the ground to someone wearing the same hardware on the ground. So they're basically having a conversation in person. Excellent. And so you said this was the second, this was the second um, uh, I guess, iteration of this particular... Yeah, so they tested the technology for the first time yesterday. Okay. Today they had kind of a friends and family event, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, they were able to talk... Um, they were able to talk together, and then what the, the goal is ultimately to drive, to drive this technology towards use for long-duration exploration of Excellent. space. Because then when you can create these personal connections, mm -hmm. you can do all sorts of things, including talk to friends and family, yeah. but maybe even talk to your physician on the ground when you're having an issue and you can better diagnose what's going on. Right. It's kind of, it, to me, this is a really good example of something that you can see the immediate impact and benefit of, you know, being able to build something or, you know, try this out the first day, establish a good comm link with the system. And you can see throughout the mission how they're going to build on this to get an immediate result by the end of the mission. That's really good to hear. Yeah, so NASA had done the one-way holoportation, mm -hmm. and we were the we we're the first flight to do the two-way holoportation. Oh, that's fantastic. That's pretty, pretty cool. Excellent. Um, one of the things you touched on earlier, um, you know, our commander, MLA, was helping out. I think you said he was helping Larry on one of his efforts. What, what are the things has, has Mike been getting up to while he's up there? Well, Mike's been helping all three of our crew customers okay. uh, tremendously with their research. One of the th most important things that he did today was a, a project called Modeling Tumor Organoids. Mm. He actually took some cells uh, that are growing in special bioreactors. They're really special plastic bags, really. But he took those cells and put them on a new microscope that's recently arrived to the ISS hmm. called, the, called the Keons microscope. Okay. It allows them to look at fluorescent markers on these cells. And so as the cells do different things, they fluoresce in different colors. Hmm. And so um, his job was to get them out of the incubator onto the mic microscope and so they can image fast get them back in the incubator so okay. that they stay viable. Yeah. Um, and he did that today. The ground operated the microscope, um, ground teams operated Very the microscope, cool. and they got some really cool images. They even got to see, at one point, some cells dividing, which really? was really fantastic. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, so it was really cool. You, 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 something you touched on there, you know, ground operating this microscope, it kind of, you know, highlights to me that there is a whole kind of team of folks on the ground helping make sure that this mission achieves all of its objectives, which there are many. Um, so what can you tell us a bit more about some of these, you know, ground, these ground positions, some of these unseen support groups that we, you know, don't really get to hear a lot about, um, but how are they helping the crew out on their orbit? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. We have a, a control room over at Mission Control Houston mm -hmm. uh, that's supporting the, the mission activities. And so our operations lead is there along with other leads that help manage the research and other aspects of planning for the mission. Okay. But here in the room behind us, we have a lot of our science teams and principal investigators that have joined uh, the mission today playing oh. as a backup room. But they are flight following in really? a sense where they're following the crew uh, and the activities with all the monitors in here. Okay. But they're able to be in the ear, so to speak, of the front room and help them guide the crew along the way through their activities on orbit, answer questions if they call down. Oh, it's excellent. So the PI or the principal investigator can be basically directly involved, um, looking over that shoulder, like you said, making sure that, you know, this, this research is being done the way that it needs to be done, but they're doing it all from the ground. Um, but they're working pretty directly with crew to, to make sure that, that, that those objectives are achieved for that research. Right. So the principal investigator can be here with us. Mm -hmm. um, in the future, they could also be remote um, okay. uh, in some places where they can be working from their home base, talking to our back room and being part of the mission. Um, ultimately, I think what we hope to enable with Axiom Station along the way is some direct interaction with the principal investigator and or the operator of the, okay. some platform on orbit with the crew because 
cutting down and uh, cutting the middleman out of that conversation often is going to make it a lot easier and a lot faster to do operations. The space station program has tried to do some of that along the way and mm -hmm. still does, but we hope to make that an operational. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, you know, you, you, had, you had touched on some of the folks over um, uh, in JSC's mission control are really working kind of more of the mission planning, um, specifically the Axiom team working the mission planning. Um, you know, and it just kind of highlights that this is a jam-packed mission. There's a lot going on, and we're about halfway through the mission. Uh, what else, you know, is crew planning for over the next few days? Well, we're going to see a lot of uh, repetition of sessions that we have started on. Okay. Um, a couple new technology demonstrations that haven't happened yet. Um, and then again, ultimately, as the mission closes out, it's going to be about collecting all the material, um, packing all of the refrigerators right. and bags that need to be, and coolers, so to speak, that need to come home and then uh, getting ready for departure, and then we'll be ready to, to receive them all, science and crew, when they get yeah. on the ground. Yeah, you mentioned receiving that science. Like, this research doesn't stop once it leaves the ISS, right? It's coming back home, and there's a lot still to unpack about all of it, right? Yeah, it, whether it's analysis of samples that come home, or in some cases, real live biology that's coming home. Yeah. And then those, those scientists are going to have to receive that. We have to quickly get it off the vehicle in their hands so they can continue their research. Excellent. Well, you know, this is going to be a jam-packed week. <laughs> it's already been very busy for the crew. And thank you for joining us, Christian. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. Excellent. All right. Well, for now, the crew has completed their work schedule for today, and they are in their sleep period. So tomorrow, we will have a special live downlink from station hosted by Space Center Houston. This will mark the halfway point of the AX-1 mission, and be sure you catch it right here live at 11.30 a.m. Central Time. For continuous updates, be sure to visit axiomspace.com. Otherwise, we'll see you right here tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central Time for an update on Flight Day 6. I'm John Rackham, wishing each of you and the crew of AX-1 a very good night.